Well, thank you very much. Um, so dietary guidelines. Uh, I start with some disclosures. These are the companies which support the dietary guidelines. So there is a number of them. We do need money from some uh, from other agencies because the EASD, who is actually behind these guidelines, does not support them with any money. Uh, so uh, we do have some unrestricted grants, and we are very glad for those. Uh, personally, um, regarding Grant support, this is a company which makes fibers, actually. These are uh, state research funding organizations. Unilever and Beneo uh, paid some honorarium. Um, OK, we are, this is about the great system, the guidelines, so there is no influence from anything else. And I don't have a dog or so <laughs> which will mitigate the risk of bias. So why do we need new guidelines? Um, well, the old ones are from 2004. I think they are still quite valid and excellent. Uh, but something has happened in between, so it's time to update it a little bit. And so we have started slowly to get going to uh, accommodate novel data um, and, well, to answer some of the pub public issues which have, have come up about lipids. Carbohydrates are almost as bad as saturated fat these days, for some people at least, and some people promote some diets, so there are some answers to give. We have a guideline group. You see all the names listed here, and we are addressing a couple of well, macronutrient topics and have grouped that a little bit with the experts we have in our uh, DNSG group about lipids, proteins, dietary patterns, carbohydrates, um, then um, the dietary patterns, carbohydrates, and prevention of diabetes. Uh, and many of the people who you see listed here are present today, and uh, we will soon discuss further guidelines. Um, so one chapter which is quite close to being finalized is a protein chapter. So what are the issues around protein? One is it's not addressed by any of the current guidelines. The Canadian guidelines say it doesn't it play any role anyway. Uh, the American guidelines actually do not say much about it except for renal insufficiency. Um, and the UK guidelines also don't mention it too much. Uh, but it does receive extensive support, and you heard Osama um, uh, talk about, give, give his talk. So there are many people who tell you if you eat high protein diets, your diabetes will be solved and there won't be any problem. You have, will have great weight loss. It's strongly satiating. It reduces weight regain. This was shown and Wim Zares reported these findings. So there is some evidence and it's also in the longer term. Then diabetes glucose control. If you don't eat carbohydrates, you will have much less postprandial glycemia. So it should work great to reduce glucose and uh, should reduce the requirements for insulin. Actually, the IDF also has a strong group which says so. And it increases postprandial energy expenditure and reduces sarcopenia. So there are many good things which people claim. But is that true? So the other part is if you look at high protein diets, they actually activate the branch chain amino acids, proliferative pathways. And there is evidence, and it's not strong evidence. It's actually from an enhanced study, and I don't think the data are very good. But what they say is that if you are young, your risk of developing cancer, your time until cancer will be much shorter. And the headline in the New York Times, and Herzl told us that this is the important thing to go for, was eating protein is as bad as smoking. So protein may have some disadvantages. If you get older, though, it seems to be much better. Then it takes much longer to get cancer. So perhaps we need age-adjusted guidelines. So there are some issues around it. So the issues are we felt that a more balanced view of the advantages is urgently needed. So is it really the solution to everything? Um, the risks of high protein diet need attention, as I just mentioned. And the effect size in diabetes control needs to be communicated based on evidence base. So we sat together and defined the criteria which we wanted to see. 50% uh, diabetes patients, 20 patients or crossover design, eight weeks duration at minimum, documented difference in protein intake. Um, and then looked around for um, uh, meta-analyses which fulfilled the criteria of the GRADE system, which is the system which we wanted to apply because we felt it's adequate. So then you have to 
describe the PICO criteria, population, intervention, and the comparator, so it was high versus low protein, more than 20% was high, below 20 was low, and population type 2 or type 1 diabetes. So um, then the outcomes. We heard that the outcomes are the really interesting thing and the only really relevant outcome is if you live or die. I don't think that's entirely true. So for diabetic people, it's microvascular and macrovascular complications, of course. And we all know we do not have any data on these endpoints. So actually, we can stop making guidelines. I mean, we don't have real evidence but we can perhaps say a little bit about it. So these irrelevant things like metabolic control and the somewhat relevant things like anthropometry are still points you can address, and we put that on our outcomes list. Um, then we used Review Manager version 5.3 and did a meta-analysis according to our criteria. There are three published um, meta-analyses which do not fulfill our criteria and which have quite severe drawbacks in our view. So um, if we do that, what about the weight and I'll very briefly go into that. Well, the published studies which achieved a difference report a weight difference in all weight loss trials, by the way. There are virtually no weight constant trials with high protein. And, and there is a 1.1 kilogram difference. So that means the control group also lost nicely weight, something like 3 to 10 kilograms, depending on the trial. But the difference was only 1 kilogram. So it's, it's somewhat helpful. And this agrees, I think, with other data, for instance, from the Diogenes study, where we also saw about the same number. Um, then, uh, sorry, this was this really? Yeah, OK. We also did all this, this uh, quality rating of the papers. And uh, well, they're always non-randomized, of course, the, inter the interventions. But otherwise, the trials were of good quality. Um, so when you go on the metabolic control parameters, HbA1c, there's actually no difference if you use higher or low protein diet. And this agrees with most meta-analyses which take a little bit longer term studies, which it doesn't really say that you can't nicely lower HbA1c with high protein diet, but people are not compliant. That's one of the points. But even if you achieve a difference, that it's not such, so great in HbA1c. Fasting blood glucose, also there's no significant difference. Um, if you go to the lipids, there is no difference, high or low protein diet, either high or low lipoprotein and triglycerides, which I don't show here. If you go to blood pressure, there is a difference. So blood pressure is lowered, which agrees, by the way, with many of the, non, of the trials in non-diabetic people, uh, and which um, is a finding which has, is of some relevance, I think. So um, if you group that together and then you, you do this grading system, Actually, we, do no, we only have low evidence for all of these outcomes, and we cannot make any strong recommendations according to the rules of grade. So we can say, well, uh, well, what we say, I will show you in a moment, is not decided. Then an important thing, of course, is um, the question of diabetic nephropathy. So what happens in people with nephropathy? This is type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients. There are quite a number of trials. There are actually quite a number of meta-analyses. And there is no change here in glomerular filtration rate, which agrees with uh, an, a Cochrane analysis from 2007 and 2009. There is another one by Nezu and co-workers, which actually sees an 8 milliliter difference, greater decline in high-protein diets uh, for glomerular filtration rate, but it's, they pretty much question their own results. Uh, and if you go for protein urea, there is also no significant difference. So. Uh, we, there are also trials about high protein from the two trials, actually, uh, which also do not see a disadvantage of high protein diets with people with diabetic nephropathy. But nephropathy, in most cases, was only albuminuria. There were very few patients with really low G of R, so we don't feel we can be too safe. So what are we going to make out of that? Well, tomorrow we'll have our guideline meeting, and then uh, I hope we make some progress and can say something about the protein part of the guidelines. We are working on the other parts, and the members which I showed you in the beginning, will report where they are, where, how it's going on. These great things are a hell of a lot of work. I mean, the real professionals here from, from Toronto and so know that. They, they do that, uh, well, a lot of the time at least. And, uh, and for a guideline group, it's quite difficult to do progress here. So we're very happy that actually John and Cyril and the other people here are, are taking over parts of this, and you saw them on the guideline list. And we hope that the European-Canadian guidelines will then make some progress. Thanks. I'll stop here. Um, Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. My questions for um, Dr. 
Pfeiffer, um, you, you classed uh, a diet um, with 20% of protein as energy as protein as a high protein diet. Um, I'm wondering whether that's a little, um, I don't know. The reason I, I question that as high is because the average intake of protein amongst Australians, according to the latest you know, national dietary data, is above 18%, 18 and a half percent. And so there are many people already consuming 20%. So I, I would have thought perhaps above 25% might be actually distinguishing um, something more, more profound about high protein diets. Well, that's a point we discussed quite a bit. Uh, in Europe, if you look at the data which were published from EPIC, for instance, and so the protein intakes are around 17%. And actually, in most trials, in, in these meta-analyses, they were a little bit higher, but this was only weight loss trials. So on constant uh, protein intake, people are around 20%. But this is only if you take some under-reporting of protein intake into consideration. So the numbers are rather 18%. But I pretty much agree with you. Uh, this is what we used for, for the selection criteria. Actually, the, most of the studies targeted higher protein intakes. But for instance, if you take the Diogenes trial, we targeted 28% and we reached 23. So even if you really provide, and this was even in the, in the supermarket centers, if you provide protein, you don't get people above 25. This is just some radicals, you know. And uh, so I, I don't think that is realistic. But the 20% is probably a limit. But if you look at these risk factor things, you know, from the NHANE study, Levine and co-workers, they also used above 20 as high, and those were the guys with a higher risk in cancer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, last question. Very short question for Olivia. Why you not met also the, uh, 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 the low uh, glycemic index for protection? Why you met only for second prevention of cancer? If you're true, of course you can put a, a primary prevention. Yeah, because yes. um, because the, I there, think are, this is true. there are uh, several studies done on um, primary prevention, so on, in epidemiological studies, but. Uh, there is a, a need for, uh, to look at also clinical trials. People with high risk of developing um, a cancer, people who had cancer may have recurrence of the cancer. Um, there is a mechanism behind uh, that could, be, uh, could support the hypothesis, the Warburg effect, for example, but also IGFs uh, and so on and so forth. So it, I think... Uh, it could be looked at um, in, in secondary prevention. There is, there is some evidence for primary prevention, um, and uh, we just think that uh, also the data is not very clean, so that, that's why we're also thinking to look at um, or, or create some guidelines for reporting GI and GL in, in dietary assessments of these epidemiological studies to try to um, tighten the data. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for presentations and questions. Now we close this session.